A small countryside town becomes the epicenter of the gruesome massacre of an innocent family. Join us today as we discuss the gnarly case of the Granov family murders. guys welcome back to another episode hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode this week's episode is done by a call take it away on monday february 22nd 1993 a married couple went to greenough to meet their friend karen mckenzie who lived there 450 miles north of perth it was a rural town in western australia Karen was a 31-year-old single mother who lived with her three children, 16-year-old Daniel, 7-year-old Amara, and 5-year-old Katrina. The family had re- had recently gotten enough money to buy a house, and the couple was visiting to help Karen with home repairs. They found Daniel lying on the driveway. Thinking it was a prank at first, the husband called out for Daniel, but he did not flinch. The husband got out of the car to check up on Daniel, but then realized it wasn't a prank. His wife screamed at him to return to the car. Horrified, the couple sped off to the nearest place where they could find a phone to call the police. Police arrived to the scene of a gruesome killing. Karen, Amara and Catherine were found axed to death in their beds. Daniel was found outside, face down with blood pooling around his body. A murder investigation is launched and many suspects are interviewed. Tire marks from an unidentified car were discovered on the driveway as well. Karen was an avid user of recreational drugs and traces of such drugs were found in her body along with alcohol. An oily substance is found on Karen's body. This substance did not match any other product found within the house. Fingerprints and a partial palm print are found as well immersed in a mysterious white substance. The findings are sent to a forensics lab for examination. It was also discovered that she had attended a house party at a friend's house a few days prior to their murders. Karen was described as a fun and outgoing person who would have helped anyone in need. Her outgoing personality made her a rebellious type when she was younger, experimenting with drugs and boys. She became pregnant with Daniel at the age of 15. Karen tried to raise her own her son on her own but found it difficult and reluctant to give it up to her mother. At 24, she met a man named Andrew Allen with whom she had two more children, Amara and Katrina. This doesn't last and they separate. As Karen grew older, she could finally afford a home of her own. She settled for a property in Greenough and was able to bring all three of her children together under one roof for the first time. By February of 1993, Karen had ended a relationship with her current boyfriend. She sent him flowers and a handwritten note with goodbye written on it on Valentine's Day. The note nor the flowers were signed, but it was obvious Karen had sent them. Both this boyfriend and her ex-husband Andrew Allen were investigated, but both were found to have solid alibis. Nevertheless, fingerprint and hair samples are collected from both men, along with 70 other suspects. Police also collect semen samples from the crime scene. Neighbors reported that two cars had been seen on Sunday night. The night suspected the murders occurred. This led police investigators to suspect that the killings had might have been gang related. This did not seem odd as Karen had a history with uh, people involved in drugs and drugs crime. People were investigated but this again led to no leads. Police decided to interview the people who had been at the house party on Friday, Feb- on Friday February 19, 1993 that Karen had attended. They were particularly drawn towards one suspect, William Mitchell, who had driven Karen back home from the party. It was reported that William and Karen had gotten into a heated argument at the party. Prints were taken from him and are show, are found to match the prints found at the house. Although damning, this wasn't this wasn't enough evidence to prove he was the killer, as he had been a frequent visitor at Karen's home during the days leading up to the murder. 
A few days later, police respond to an anonymous call explaining that someone had broken into the house where the party Karen had attended had occurred. Responding to the call, police entered the house to find a wallet and keys on the living room table. This wallet is discovered to be that of William Mitchell. Suddenly, Mitchell runs into the living room, screaming frantically. The detectives are alarmed and calm him down. Mitchell is described as wearing only a towel with bloodstains around his groin. Detectives question Mitchell as to what happened. He explained that he had come to visit the house to speak with the host of the party. When he arrived, he rang the doorbell and was confronted by three men who forcibly brought him into the house. They stripped him of his clothes and held him down. Mitchell explained that the three men were convinced that the owner of the house was the man responsible for the murders of Karen and her family. When Mitchell explained he did not know the whereabouts of the man, the three men threatened him by trying to sever his penis. He managed to rummage through them and escape into a bathroom where he locked himself. Mitchell was rushed to a nearby hospital to wave to have his wounds treated. While there, police questioned him thoroughly on his recent ordeal, but he seemed to miss key details and contradict himself. Under heavy scrutiny, Mitchell finally cracked and confessed to making the whole thing up. There was no three men and the wounds were self-inflicted in an attempt to kill himself due to personal reasons, which he reported. Police charged Mitchell for making a false statement. It was later found out how Mitchell had actually inquired his injuries. In a nearby caravan park, a local worker at the park made a shocking discovery. A plastic bag was found next to a trailer containing pornographic magazines and razor blades. The site was also contaminated with blood and semen. The worker informed the manager of the park, who in turn informed the police, under, under the suspicion that the perpetrator of the killings in Granif might have been responsible. The police investigated the site and took blood semen samples. The samples were found to be a match with those found at the crime scene at Granif. The findings of the caravan park were not reported to the media. A few days later, due to some technical errors, the police needed to retake the fingerprint of some 20 suspects, including William Mitchells. An officer was dispatched to Mitchells' property to collect the samples. Although Mitchell seemed emotionless about the killings, he showed great interest in the police investigation and media coverage surrounding the case. When the officer arrived, Mitchell was more than happy to offer his fingerprints but seemed surprised. He questioned the officer, quote, I'm surprised you're still going on with this investigation. I thought you'd caught the bloke who did this. I heard in the press that he was behaving very strangely in the caravan park and you caught up with him. The statement sent chills down the officer's spine, but he kept his cool. He waved off Mitchell's remarks and collected his fingerprints. After taking them to the forensic lab, he demanded they be tested immediately. They came back as a match. The last piece of damning evidence was unearthed when a chemist identified the oily substance found on Karen's body and the substance the finger and the substance the fingerprints, which are now identified as Mitchell's, were immersed in. And they are the same, and are, are identified as hand lotion from a popular brand in Australia. This cemented that Mitchell was present in the house when the murders took place. Mitchell was, was arrested by police in Perth on 29th of March, a full five weeks after the Grizzly murders took place. Mitchell was questioned by police and he agreed to show them how the murders took place. He was escorted to the Mackenzie home, where he would describe his killing spree to the police. He was described as emotionless and methodical while explaining how he went about the murders. He could have been telling us how he washed his car yesterday afternoon the way he was telling us how he killed them. Mitchell's testimony was beginning to paint a frighteningly nightmarish picture of the events that took place that fateful night. Mitchell had been taking drugs and alcohol all day on the 21st of February, 1993. He had been enraged that Karen had, had refused his advances at the party in a few nights prior. He decided he was going to kill her and took his axe and his car and drove almost 40 kilometers to Greneff. Upon entering the driveway late at night, around 3 a.m., he was met by Daniel, who was the only one awake. Daniel had heard a car pull up onto the driveway and decided to check out who it was. Upon approaching Mitchell, he was violently struck in the head by his axe, explaining why he was the only body found outside. Mitchell then proceeded to enter the house where he found Karen asleep on the living room floor. He hit her head with the axe multiple times, her muscles spasming from the trauma. He then proceeded to look for drugs in her cupboard but found, her, but found hand lotion. He used it as lubricant and proceeded to rape Karen's lifeless body. 
Mitchell then investigated the house and found seven-year-old Amara sleeping in her room. Her killing was described as the most brutal in the family, and there were signs that she had been raped as well. Mitchell then turned his attention to five-year-old Katrina's room and savagely killed her in her sleep. Mitchell then went to the bathroom to clean his hands of blood. He left the house with the axe and a bottle of lotion. On his drive back, he disposed of the axe in Greenwich River and even showed detectives where he had thrown it. The following day, a dive team was sent to retrieve the axe and it was found successfully. Even though it had been almost five weeks since the killings and the axe had been sitting at the muddy bottom of a fast flowing river, there were still hairs and blood adorning its tip. When asked why he had killed the entire family, he said he didn't know. The full details of the killings are never to be reported under law due to its grotesque nature. Mitchell was stood on trial shortly after the investigation. His defense protested that he had been under a drug and drunken rage and he could not be held fully responsible for his actions. The judge found this argument absurd. Quote, he was sober enough to drive the 40 kilometers to Greenwich and methodically kill each member of the family. End quote. The judge sentenced Mitchell to four consecutive life sentences and three counts of indecent behavior with a dead body and with a non-parole period of 20 years. The judge explained that the non-parole period was the hardest decision he had ever made. Quote, I do not know if Mitchell would be reformed enough for release in 20 years. End quote. Due to the gruesome nature of the Greenough murders, many Australians called for the reinstating of the death penalty. Just the following year, a full bench of the Western Australian Supreme Court ruled that Mitchell would never be released from prison. The Western Australian Director of Public Prosecutions had appealed against the original sentence in a 2-1 to war. They ordered that he spend the rest of his life behind bars. He would be the first Australian to be sentenced to true life imprisonment under the stronger laws. Two years later, however, this ruling was overturned, meaning that one day Mitchell could be up for parole. Uh, with his first parole hearing scheduled for 2013. Karen's mother began to protest against the re release of Mitchell in 2007. Quote, 14 years on, and I'm still angry. My life is always spent wondering if he'll be released. We have no proof that he's not going to be let out. For all we know, he could walk out and could kill someone else, and I would hate for somebody to have to go through what we went through. End quote. After Mitchell was downgraded to a medium security prison in 2010, due to the possibility of release. A petition was signed by over 18,000 people to deny parole to Mitchell. Once again, Mitchell would be denied parole, which meant that he would be eligible for parole in 2019. However, in 2018, new laws would be introduced, which meant the mass murderers and serial killers would not be considered for parole period uh, for parole for a period of up to six years. Beforehand, they would be able to apply for parole every three years, but under this sentence, administration had amendment this that was increased to six years. Karen's sister Evelyn has said that she will fight until her last breath to keep Mitchell behind bars. Quote, Mitchell knows what I think, she said. Quote, I told him as long as I've got breath left in my body, I'm going to do everything I can to keep him inside. Wow. Well, it heard about this case. <sighs> this Mitchell guy, my first impression of him is that he's an absolute loony tune. Really? Yeah, I mean, just the way, the way he tried to fake the attack of, by the three men, and the way like he just like he basically gave himself up nobody yeah the, yeah like it wasn't in the news anywhere that they had found that thing in the caravan park but then he just said it blatantly he's like oh you guys are you guys are still investigating this didn't you go find the guy like, oh no no we didn't find the guy he's like no nah, no nah, it's him bro it's him and they caught him they beat him up from the jail Why'd you pick this case? I don't know, just the, the gruesome nature of the case, that's why. Mm, I, think I think it's, it's like... the most gruesome, it was, it's the most gruesome case in Western Australian history. I don't know, I feel like he's like a kind that wants to seek attention, but like he, lives off of it, and a complete loser. I mean, he's a loser. He was 24 years old, he was just a farm man. Why would you say he, he seeks attention? What is the, where, where did you get that from? Because he kept drawing a lot of attention to himself. One, by being too distinct into the investigation, like that's completely insane. What what sort of person mm -hmm. would um, 
completely invest themselves into such an investigation because it kind of like takes the police off at some point like you know something's up with the guy and i don't know and then he comes up with a fake ass story that wasn't even required of him to do so just just because he thinks it would might throw the police off course or something but no nah, mm. it doesn't it just i don't know i felt like i don't know i feel like he's mentally ill to some degree i mean to rape little girl do you think he should spend life in prison yes why he raped two kids and killed them and they were minors he posed absolutely no threat to him He's, like i'm pretty sure this dude didn't even have any emotion like there was no remorse at all it's just like when you said the way he taught um explained to the police how he had done it it felt like he enjoyed every moment of it so sick people like that stay in jail because clearly there's no such treatment that could like get them to have feelings and stuff like that or feel sorry for what they've done so they're better off in a prison like cell where they're not a threat to society mm. I mean think about it what would you have done to make this person feel or um make him not be a threat to society you can't exactly lecture them about um empathy and all of that like it's not just gonna you know mentally rewire their brains into doing things you know like i don't know i just feel like he needs a lot of lot of medication an actual help if he is to be put back into society but just for the sole purpose that he raped two kids and killed them them being minors he does deserve a life sentence how old was the son 16 years old that to a minor so three minors and, the, and when you kill a minor there are like harsh sentences for that i mean the thing is like the defense was just the fact what he did because he was drunk and he was drugged which i mean it doesn't stand up like you drove you were sober enough to drive 40 kilometers so i'm like like he's 24 years old if he was like 16 or 17 and he did this like maybe i would understand you know you're young you're dumb you're impulsive but then 24 years old like your your brain has matured by them i mean even then his anger was targeted to its mckenzie right and his kids well at least the two daughters weren't even awake to witness such things so why would he put in the effort to go to their rooms kill them and rape them like that doesn't make sense like If your anger is towards her, you kill her and you run or do something. Because mm. even after killing her, it doesn't hit him that he just committed a crime. Now, I, I genuinely felt like he's like one of those killers that enjoyed every single moment of a drug or no drug. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this insane case. I personally just feel really angry, but hope you guys enjoyed it. <clears throat> totally not in like a good way, but you know. See you guys next week. Adios. <laughs>